Hello, welcome everybody. I'm Sam Schechner from uh, the Wall Street Journal. Um, the title of this panel is, Is Tech Killing Democracy? So if you fell asleep sometime in 2009, you might have thought that social media was going to topple dictatorships and democratize the world. Instead, you wake up today and you see the title of this panel and you see uh, people going to vote in the United States while Facebook is taking down fake Instagram accounts and uh, Twitter's taking down Twitter's uh, fake Twitter accounts. So we're going to talk with our two panelists, Vera Jarova, the uh, EU Commissioner for Justice, Consumers, and Gender Equality, and George Kurtz, founder and CEO of CrowdStrike, about what the problem is and what we can do to solve it. So let's start by defining the problem. Today, George, you're American. Uh, Americans are going out to vote in the midterm election, contentious election. Donald Trump's making it a referendum on, on himself. Is that election being manipulated? Well, it's a good question. First, I did my absentee voting, so I already did my, my duty. But I think if you look at almost any election, you can say in some form or fashion, there's probably some manipulation that's taking place. Uh, and really, the, the focus of this panel here is to talk about how people can be manipulated into changing their vote and changing the narrative. And we've seen that uh, certainly over the last couple of years, and in particular in, uh, in 2016 in the, in the presidential elect election. So it's a major problem, and when we dive into the details, uh, I think it's something that everyone should be concerned about. Vera, do, do you think, I mean, there's European Parliament elections we were just talking about coming up next spring. Are, are those going to be manip manipulated as well? I mean... Mm. Well, every uh, election campaign is a kind of manipulation but the people should be aware of the moments when they get political messages uh, which fall under the political campaign, and this is what we want. Uh, we, you started uh, saying that the digital uh, world should not, uh, uh, sh should, should not produce dictatorships. No, it's, it's my word. We should uh, be much better and much more careful about not producing dictatorship and autocratic uh, regimes and uh, not to manipulate the people to cast their vote in that direction. So what we don't want in Europe is to repeat uh, what happened in American elections, also in, in a referendum in UK. We want free elections in the EU where uh, the people will be aware that they read uh, the political campaigning uh, uh, adver advertising, but also to protect the people against the abuse of their personal data. Because what we saw, what happened under the Cambridge Analytica case, it was a brutal manipulation. Uh, using the private, the intimate data of people, and this is something which we uh, have to not, not to allow to, to happen before any further elections in the EU. But, so, but you said elections are about trying to manipulate public opinion. So what's, what's really new about this? I mean, I, I got a pamphlet telling me something fake, uh, you know, 20 years ago. What, what, what's different today that makes this a new threat? Well, I think if you look at today and the use of social media and the internet, the ability to actually <clears throat> help influence elections across borders has never been easier. And certainly there's always been manipulation of, you know, the internal message for a country and, and their people. But when you have other countries that are now reaching out and uh, creating sustained campaigns to actually influence and change the vote and change the narrative for uh, people in different countries, I think it's very problematic. And I think there's a way to do it now with not a lot of friction. There was a lot more effort 20 years ago to actually do it. In today's day and age, you know, a couple of fake Twitter accounts, I'd say a couple, more than a couple, but hundreds, thousands of fake Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts and blog posts and web pages, it's all an integrated narrative to create what seems to be a, a real movement for a particular party, but uh, a narrative behind the scenes by individual countries. You asked what's new. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking about EU and member states, uh, the rules for political campaigning offline are very strict. The rules for political campaigning online are uh, very mild or even not existent. 
and this is what has to change. That's why we recommended the member states uh, to look into the situation and to apply the rules for political campaigning, also for online campaigning, because it, it, it must not, uh, it cannot remain the, the jungle that uh, you are uh, the object of manipulation, you are the object of the political campaign, and you do not have a clue about that. But so it sounds like we're talking about, you know, kind of evil people figuring out how to manipulate people all over. Is, is this a problem of just bad actors using a tool that could be good or could be bad? Or is there something more essential to the, these kinds of social tools or the way our brains are wired that make us susceptible to this kind of manipulation? I didn't want to, to draw such an apocalyptic picture. <laughs> of course, so we speak about political parties campaigning, uh, we speak about the member states setting the rules for political campaigning, and we speak about the people who are consumers of these messages. This, this is a normal world, uh, and we want this normal world also to, to live in online a sphere. So uh, I think that this is nothing dark, this is nothing which we cannot tackle, but uh, we have to be more resilient and more careful about how the, the political campaign is up and running in the EU member states. But are we somehow, is there a difference between, you know, reading uh, a reasoned argument in print in a text versus being bombarded by targeted video messages on your newsfeed? In, in terms of just how it psychologically affects you? Uh, every, everybody who does the, the marketing, and, and polit including political campaigning, will tell you that there are two uh, uh, channels. One is the official one, and then manipulative uh, content. And uh, we have to get used to the situation when the people are sitting in front of their screens and they are consuming uh, uh, all, all the things which are coming to them uh, through digital channel. But uh, uh, again, uh, the, in the EU, and I'm here in, uh, in the position of the European legislator, we do not want to overshoot and overdo the regulation. We want the elections to be free and to guarantee the, the uh, free choice for people. And that's why we are recommending the member states to apply the rules for offline also to online. But of course, uh, speaking about the manipulative content, uh, we cannot do too much about it because then we would shift to the sphere of censorship. And this is something which we do not want to have in Europe. Sam, let me just yeah. comment on that. I think one of the things that the individuals and countries behind us have figured out is really exploiting social proof. And if we think about online, you know, we look, about, look at everyone's status. Everybody's looking at how many followers they have and, you know, who's uh, verified and, and just the, the overall stature of who's posting things. And when you have enough followers and you have enough cross post and cross followers, it looks and legitimizes those users. In fact, we've tracked many bots that we've seen people have conversations with. And it looks like it's a user with a lot of followers and a lot of tweets and it just you know, they try to come off authentic. So that social proof, you know, Sam, if you approve something or like something, well, I might look at it and say, yeah, that must be legit. I know Sam and, and he read this and it, it looks, you know, if, if he's gonna legitimize it, that's good for me. And I think that's one of the areas that they've really been able to exploit to their benefit. So what, what can be done about that, that you're kind of giving manipulators a bigger gun, you know, people who would have done this before, some of whom are just political parties, some of whom are doing this to nefarious ends. You say that you don't want censorship. What kind of rules should there be? First of all, I would like to mention the General Data Protection Regulation, which is known under the acronym of GDPR. We have the strictest rules uh, in the world, in the EU, protecting the privacy of people. And uh, this is this is the basic principle which has to be obeyed uh, in, in the political campaigns uh, in, in the member states, that the access to people's data will not be abused. Uh, the micro-targeting and profiling uh, must not be abused uh, in, in, the, in the political campaign. And I, I will share with you my personal experience. Uh, I lived half of my life in totalitarian regime. I come from the Czech Republic, uh, where there was a 
unfortunately, a revolution in 1989. And when I heard about what happened in this Cambridge Analytica case, my basic instinct was that I have experienced that. Uh, something like we are just objects. We don't have a free choice. Uh, our data was stolen and the, the messages were targeted, tailored to us without any clue that we are the objects of it. And it's, it's like a bad science fiction film. And uh, I don't want to compare the digital sphere with totalitarian regime. Of course, it's totally different story. But the result might be that the free choice of people in elections will be limited. And I think this is something which we have to fight against, and that's why we are alerting uh, everybody uh, responsible, be it member states, be it digital sector, be it political parties, to comply with the rules of GDPR, because uh, only through compliance with GDPR we can guarantee the people that they will remain subjects, not objects, uh, easy to manipulate. One of the panelists who was supposed to be here uh, was Nick Clegg, former deputy PM of uh, the UK, now the global head of policy communications for Facebook. He bowed out um, after getting that new job. What would you tell him his responsibility is? In an uh, anytime I meet uh, the high managers of big tech companies, uh, I ask them, how will you uh, fix and, and repair the world which you have spoiled. <laughs> and they know that I am exaggerating, that I am partly joking. But, but seriously, we need to renew the balance of power and responsibility. And when I speak to people, to, to the managers of Facebook and, and Google and others, uh, to what extent they find themselves responsible for the content which they uh, provide and, and to which they uh, produce partly. Uh, this debate is shifting. Uh, they, I, more and more I hear that the, the big uh, tech companies uh, are aware that they grabbed too much power, which is not balanced with responsibility. That's why more and more we hear about the projects like New Contract for Web or our code of conduct against hate speech uh, falls also under this chapter of let's be more responsible. Uh, I was in Silicon Valley last year and it was really minority opinion of the managers from high tech companies who, who told me, we are just pipes. We have nothing to do with the content. Minority opinion. So we have to work together and Nick Clegg could uh, use his experience uh, from politics and from public sector, uh, understanding the limits of the legislators and the potential of the business to, to do much better. George, do you think that tech companies should be more responsible for the content that's on their platform? Well, it's an interesting debate, an ongoing question. I think that technology companies can help solve this problem uh, around the manipulation of of elections, and in particular when you look at things like fake news and bots and um, a lot of what's happening uh, in the social media platforms, using something like AI, uh, you can actually find these bots, I don't want to say relatively easily, but uh, with good data science you can actually find them. We've done it at CrowdStrike, I mean just, it's not even what we do, but we've got a whole data science team that just basically decided that they were going to look at fake news and uh, some of the posts across uh, various platforms and just looking at a few features and individual characteristics of these posts and how they actually work, we were able to tell what is legitimate posts versus bots. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but I think there has to be a big focus on trying to weed out a lot of the automation in what's happening and then at least then focus on the human element and who's actually buying the ads and what are they actually doing. So I think each platform has a responsibility to clean up some of what's going on because it's been the wild, wild west for too long. Okay, so let, but let, let, let's dig into that. You can identify bots and remove them. You know, that's, that's supposedly what Twitter did. They removed 10,000 bots that were promoting messages like uh, 
purporting to say that uh, you know men should stay home to give women a you know more sway in the midterm vote, try to discourage liberal men from from voting. Um, what, what if what if the political party just wants to use a botnet to encourage people to vote? What's wrong with that? Well, I think you have to look at the terms of service, and a lot of the terms of service basically state you can't be a bot. Number one. Number two is, it, the interesting part about cleaning this up is actually not in the best interest of any social media platform because if you look at how they're actually metric, it's by number of users. So a 10,000 bot cleanup is actually a drop in a bucket for Twitter. I mean, you're talking about a lot more hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of bots that are out there. So to clean those up, that actually impacts their overall user count, which when you're a public company, okay. has an impact. So. It's, it's a bit of a dichotomy in that they need to clean it up, but they're not necessarily incented to. All right, so let's take it the other way then. What about legitimate actual people, not inauthentic accounts, who are spreading conspiracy theories, inaccurate information, wrong day to go vote, things like that? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you distinguish what is somehow illegitimate speech from legitimate speech? I don't know that it's their job to distinguish illegitimate versus legitimate speech. As you know, we talked about beforehand, uh, many countries, well, certainly the U.S. has uh, free speech as one of its first amendments. So I don't know that they need to be in the business of dealing with that, but certainly from an automation and a bot perspective, I think there is uh, some responsibility that they have. First of all, on the bots, uh, uh, well, uh, I still believe that uh, democracy is uh, when the people speak to people, that it's people to people communication. And that's why I think that we should do everything to get rid of the cases when the people are uh, the targets of some, some artificial intelligence uh, or robots and, uh, and bots. And uh, I think that uh, this is one of the, of the things which we have to pay attention to. But you asked about the uh, illegal content and, and disinformation. Uh, we are in the EU trying to apply one principle to push the digital industry, the IT providers, to apply the existing law. So one existing law we the... speak about criminal law, in fact. Now we want them to delete uh, the terrorist messages. It's, it's absolutely legitimate. They should do it because this is very dangerous and they don't like themselves to provide the space for terrorists for their communication. So this is what we want them to do. We want them to delete hate speech, which is prohibited by the criminal law in all the member states. We want them to delete child pornography. So this is the principle we apply in the EU we are not speaking about Germany now, because Germany already has the law which imposes legal liability on IT companies to delete uh, the hate speech under sanction. Up to, up to 50 million uh, euros. We didn't want to, uh, to, to do this for the whole Europe, so Germany goes uh, oh, its own way. But I, the whole time I speak here about illegal content, the content which is prohibited by the law already. But speaking about disinformation, it's lying, and lying is not illegal. That's why we need to use other way to, to fight against it. So that's why uh, we are supporting uh, the movements of fact checkers. We have uh, the professionals to work in this field of uh, uh, fact checking, uh, which uh, is necessary to limit the external uh, propaganda and, and many other things. George, does fact-checking scale? I, I, I don't think it scales. You know, I come at it from the tech angle, and you know, how much technology can you use to actually clean up the platform is the way I look at it. Uh, if you look at facts and stats, uh, they're manipulated. Uh, every election that we have, you can look at the same issue on both sides, and somebody's gonna come up with their own facts for it. So I don't know that the platforms are gonna be able to scale and, and clean that up, but I think there's a lot of automation that can take place for things that are not legitimate and uh, at least start with that and get that out of the way. And then, um, you know, people can figure out how they want to clean up hate speech and, and some of the other things the commissioner talked about. Well, we're almost out of time. Very briefly, do you think there's any chance that we can get back to that world where social media helps breed democracy as opposed to kill it? We have to manage it. We have to manage it together to join forces 
and to bring more responsibility to this world? I think we can. I think social media plays a valuable role in society. We've got, you know, we've got to go through the trough of dis disillusionment and uh, get to a better spot. But I get asked all the time, you know, about the elections and, and what do I think. And, and candidly, I, I think it's easier to change someone's mind to change their ballot than to actually change the physical ballot or the electronic ballot. So it's a, it's a problem that we need to contend with, and I'm sure we will. And it's a great opportunity for a lot of the entrepreneurs in the audience. Well, thanks to the both of you, uh, and uh, please give our panelists a hand. Thanks a lot.